I won't pick up on this, uh, this discussion on Catholics and Protestants, but uh, Olaf Eliasson, you know, a great artist, he said the difference between a Catholic and a Protestant is the length of their shadow. <laughs> now, if you take that into consideration in how things are supposed to be in our physical environment, we're obviously already there. Now, most people believe that we took our name from a mountain in Norway called uh, Snøhetta. They're wrong. We took the name from a beer place downtown Oslo <laughs> called uh, Dovre Hallen, which means the Hall of Dovre, and this mountain area where Snøhetta is the highest peak is called Dovre. And we established our first practice on top of the Hall of Dovre, where we had the back stair, passing the toilets into this place, drinking our beers, and saving the world on napkins. <laughs> now, it is important to understand that the drive, the sort of in-between situation of being an artist, being an architect, not really being taken seriously, that we establish sort of systems to be taken seriously. We don't think things that you don't need or don't want. We are architects, we're designers, we're artists, we're psychologists, sociologists, and we definitely don't solve the world um, on napkins. So I'm going to dive a little bit into how we work, try to give you an overview of certain things that we have sort of started finding out about ourselves throughout the period of almost 30 years. It's important because most of the time you post-rationalize. And there's nothing wrong with post-rationalization. What happens is you go back and you understand why you did something intuitively. And it's this kind of translation of intuition that actually brings our collectiveness back. And we've defined it as collective intuition. Now, that sounds like you know, opposites, but really, in the end, if you understand it correctly, it works. So, creativity, which is at the core of what we do, quite obviously, is distinctive. Which means distinctive not in the sense that it's taken out of space, taken out of nowhere, but it's distinctive to time, and it's distinctive to, uh, distinctive to where you are, and it's distinctive to your complete physical surroundings. But, almost like these reindeer here from Dovre, you know, their, their genetical code is distinctive. They're the oldest living reindeer family in the world. And I'll show you later that we actually found them painted on the walls of uh, the caves of Lascaux 30,000 years ago. Now, we're talking about distinctive simplification, getting to the core of things, getting the values right, not distinctive in the sense Simplification, not simplification in the sense of banal, not in the sense of populist simplification, but the simplification where all the ingredients of the soup are still existing and the taste gets stronger. It's this kind of simplification where the layers of complexity are still intact, they're still at hand, but it's distinctive. Now we've played with words for the last 30 years, and one of them that is defining a lot of our working processes is, a word, is the word transposition. We just call it transing, short. Um, and it's actually not cross-professional. It's taking it one step further. It is, in fact, a method of transpositioning yourself as part of a group into a singular. You become the singular in the plural. You, in fact, become, as an individual, a part of a larger theme. And that theme is then consisting of a transposition of different professions, similar to how musicians practice their instruments in a larger orchestra. They would swap instruments. You don't get anywhere, we found out, by just collecting specialists around the table and have them communicate. Now you have to be the architect if you are the artist. The artist has to be the landscape architect. The landscape architect has to be the psychologist in the creative process. But if you leave the creative process, you go back 
look at the orchestra. When you perform, okay, you go back to your violin, you go back to your trumpet. But in the creative process, you have to let the whole thing go. Because we're looking for the musician in the engineer. We want a total experience of how you can actually contribute into a process. Now, located for the moment, you know, in these major cities, Oslo and New York, uh, we always look for a similar location, and as you understand, architects are very, very sort of specific about where they have their offices and practice. But since then, you know, we've uh, established practices in other major cities around the world, like Adelaide in Australia, like Innsbruck in Austria. And we just love these random sites where nobody else would actually establish any practice, any studio. And we love when people tell us, competitors, how random is that? <laughs> now, if you look at what we do, it will always be about people. People are at the core of what we do, what we deal with every day on an everyday basis. It doesn't really matter how you define it and how you look at it. But let's say you would have a process similar to this, with the people being all these small little bubbles inside. And very clearly, you can see there is one person here going straight for the goal. So these are the conditions. The cylinder is there, sort of define the conditions. But there's one guy who goes straight for the goal, and he misses. All the others are moving freely inside these conditions that we have set for this particular project. And slowly, as you get there, it might be you know, some sort of sentence that in the end sort of moves the goal into position, because all goals are dynamic. And all of a sudden, that manages to funnel all these people into one direction. This is collective intuition within certain boundaries. So that obviously gives us the opportunity to look at completely different diagrams of organization. This is a classical organizational diagram where you, know, you have a group of, especially sitting here, another one here, another one here. These communicate internally, they become offices in the office, they sort of don't speak together. But we are lucky, we can have a, a diagram looking more like this. It makes a lot of sense, I tell you. Once you actually are located in a place like this, there is no other way you can deal with it. You know, because if you want to get order into this chaos, then forget about it, because you'll be lost. It is important, however, that this sort of people at the core is expanded. And we just had a great example from IBM, how you actually expand on the definition of how to collaborate with all the stakeholders, clients, users, uh, with how people are actually getting close to the problems uh, they're dealing with and the problems at heart. I think, however, that we are really quite value-driven. So we wouldn't be happy with concepts, contextualized concepts, unless at the same time they have a driving human value at the bottom, not only content. And from that point of view, we organize exhibitions, large workshops. Uh, we invite people in. We have them working in our own physical workshop. And, of course, to play the game, everything that is happening is important. So like these people, we did a book for a, a company called Sumtober, a lighting company. We interviewed four people over 100 years old about the light north of the polar circle. Now, all of a sudden, you can lift one individual to become a hero, right? So Anna was then, she was 104, and then we could all already, she'd never left uh, her home, basically, but she was then exhibited in Berlin for a large exhibition. I think it's, it's a matter of getting close to the people you deal with. The second thing that we're dealing with is obviously process. We've often been asked, what is the most important project you're doing? And of course, the obvious answer, not always well thought of by the clients, but it doesn't really matter. We say Snöhetta is the most important project. Our company is, for us, the most important project. So the process itself then becomes a part of how you deal with these exact issues that are related to your own DNA, the company DNA, the culture that you build over a 30-year period. We've had people study us. PhDs have been written 
researchers have looked at what does snow hetero do when they are at their best. What kind of procedures do we follow? And slowly, slowly, we were again post-rationalizing what we had done 20 years before into this book. We found that there were a certain number of drivers, I'm going to show you some few of them, that were not all of them all the time present, but at least some of them all the time present in creative working uh, procedures that we're dealing with. One of them is zooming. And it was a driver that seemed to come out of nowhere, because it's obvious. But once you put a word to zooming, both in and out, it made sense. Yes, you look at things from the distance and you zoom out. But you also look at them close, and you have an imagination of this sort of scale difference between things when you create them. So all of a sudden, you're zooming in and out like an automatic camera. But you can also go all the way into the detail, and you can no longer design things only from a conceptual point of view or from a detail or material point of view. You have to do it at the same time. So you keep zooming in and out in these kind of designs, all the way down to the chairs that, for instance, go into the Library of Alexandria, which I was just showing. Like this one here, probably the smallest museum that we've designed. It's all about framing. Um, and it's also ready-made. But it's also part of a larger concept, which I'll get back to, of projects that we, to uh, that we call keyless structures, structures without keys. They cannot be closed. They're open 24 hours a day. So you can see this ready-made is really just a concrete box, which you normally use to get rivers to flow under roads or similar things, create tunnels. And all of a sudden, that can be a museum. But we frame also through, let's say, graphic design and things that we develop in our graphic design department by just simply creating reference systems that all of a sudden become uh, comprehensible to the users. Generative resistance is important. If it goes easy, it's no fun. We've been struggling for the last seven or eight years to get clients to understand that energy consumption in a building is massively important, and most people slowly understand, yes, we understand it's costing us money, energy consumption is costing us money. What is still hard is to make them understand that it's not really about the energy consumption, it's about the CO2 footprint. Which means when you calculate sort of the energy consumption of a building today, you also have to take into account what we call embodied energies. It means all the energy that goes into all the materials, the, the, the clothing of the workers, the food they are eating, the transport. And at the end, you have to calculate the amount of energy that goes into recycling that building when it's dead. Now, only then can you have a, a negative or even neutral CO2 building. Before you start calculating these issues, it's a superficial CO2 neutral or negative building, normally calculated over a period of 50 to 60 years. So this is one we're doing in Tonheim. It'll be the northernmost completely real CO2 negative building. Another one is saying, you know, people come and say, oh, OK, this was outside of Paris. We want one million square meters of um, shopping center, hotels, and so forth, on farmland in Paris. They don't know where to get the food from. And then they start building on the little amount of farmland they have. So we suggested, why don't you build one million square meters of farmland? And below the farmland, you have your shopping centers and hotels and whatever. And because of the heat that actually comes from the bottom up, you can harvest potatoes twice. Right? So what happens, coincidentally, the average French farm is about a million square meters, if you calculate the Alps in. And all of a sudden, it was a vulnerable farm, very, very economically efficient, could be given to the local community, and all of a sudden you had a shopping center, which made sense. But it can be one-family houses testing, experimenting, continuously evolving all the systems existing and inventing new ones. This is a real, truly CO2-negative one-family house. But working against the forces can also be when you come as an architect, say, to Guatemala City, like in this case, and you have a mayor saying to you, 
look, we love what you've been doing in different places of the world. Now design something important for us. Okay. No, you don't. What we did, we said, yes, we'll design something for you, and it'll be important, but not for you. So what happens is we design benches together with local artisans to protect the sidewalks from cars. So the ladies could still sell their tomatoes and their oranges continuously all the way through Guatemala City. And you will find about 300 of these benches located around different locations in Guatemala City at the present, but there will be coming more. Liberating laughter. I don't have to say much, but you know, it prolongs your life. It's true. Don't ever let a possibility of laughing uh, get lost. Be curious. When we were invited to do the project on Ground Zero, the first thing we started debating was, might there really be two realities, apropos fake news? Might it really be the case that you can really see through a lens or through a prisma two things, one thing, see one thing twice at the same time? Yes, you can. So, do you know if this is the real car or this is the real car? They're located, the car is located in only one place, but it has two images. So which one is the true image? You can only see that because you can reference it back to the building, and you can see that this is the cutout of our office space, so this is the real location of the car. And we sort of introduced this into the World Trade Center Memorial Pavilion, saying, okay, what if we use these prismas to catch certain different types of realities and bring them back into the building through light? So we had this prismatic facade throwing massive amounts of different directions of light coming in to the building. Now, obviously, dismissed immediately by the client, uh, simply because, you know, you could imagine if a bom bomb went off and all these glass splinters uh, started sort of uh, flying around. But the issue was, it's more about the mirroring of now, the presence. Rapid prototyping, we've heard about it today, it's extremely important. But the thing is, rapid prototyping is not only digital. We work this border zone between analog and digital, and digital and analog, back and forth continuously between the two. So even if you have a digital production line, you might have to go and look for the wood. So this wood is grown, then picked and sort of treated, and then it goes into the actual production line. So there is no such thing as leaving the elements that you actually have, even if you go digital. Getting physical, another one, very important. You have to walk. You have to walk around. We take the office, the New York office, Adelaide office, to Snohetta every year. It's great. We have what we call Snohetta. Uh, no, we have what we call Dovre conversations. We lay out the whole plan for the, next, uh, for, the, for the year, together with everyone there. We walk, get everyone up. You know, if you've worked in the New York office, walk the sidewalks of the Bronx with only about this much landscape. Okay, Every, everyone makes it. Everyone gets up there. Everyone understands that it's important to go up there. And everyone's so happy when they made it. But it's also physical in the workshop. It's really testing out things together with the clients. Actually building things with your hands. Getting all the way down to understand the different things of everything that we create when we started looking at Arabic calligraphy and how it was dealt with, all of a sudden we understood there was a physical element completely different to the profiling of our letters, deeply embedded in Arabic uh, 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 graphic uh, signs and symbols. Now this, this little twist here is called the farka, and that tells you that there is a back side and a front side to this letter. That gives us the possibility to actually develop a 3D model. You can develop a 3D model from our letters, but they would just be extrusions. They wouldn't have a front side and a back side. So what we actually did was try to do all the letters we could find, define them as a three-dimensional thing, and then sort of look at that in a sequence of combinations, which all of a sudden became an Arabic pattern, which they hadn't seen before. But getting physical also means being together. 
in one of our cabins, one of the keyless structures, or diving in to the actual quarries, picking the stone, holding the stone. It means teaching the stonemasons at the border of Sudan and Aswan in Egypt to actually hand carve the walls of the library in Alexandria. Knowledge-based intuition. I'm getting back to this. In the book of Italo Calvino called Invisible Cities, there's a conversation between Marco Polo and Kublai Khan. They debate the Roman arch. What is the Roman arch? And Kublai Khan says, the Roman arch consists of a keystone, and this keystone is our culture. If you remove the keystone from the Roman arch, it collapses. Right? Economy is the foundation here. If you shake the foundation, as long as you have the pressure on these stones, it doesn't matter if you shake the foundation. But if you remove the keystone, everything collapses. So for Saudi Arabia, we designed a building which would collapse if you took away the keystone. The whole building would sort of fall over. And the keystone is lifelong learning. This is the keystone constructed. It actually holds up the building. And it's the smallest piece. It is translating knowledge, which intuitively is hit by another thought, and all of a sudden becomes a new idea. That is a concept. Or it could be understanding that you can transport one solid piece of stone, 160 tons, to Berlin. Transporting a piece of Norway to Berlin. Now, of course, it's hard to do it. It's the biggest stone that's ever been transported out of Norway. But at the same time, it's possible. And it's much cheaper than any glass facade to cover the Norwegian embassy in Berlin. It was only the ambassador was a little unhappy because he wanted a window here, but, you know, who cares? <laughs> Now, again, back to this situation of Lascaux. It's fantastic. We, were, we won a competition to redesign sort of the visitor center and a copy of the caves in Lascaux. And I'll get back to that when, it, when we're dealing with these things. Being generous, very important. Library in Alexandria, big space, open, accessible to the public, what you get back. Them defending it during the Arabic Spring, holding hands around the building 24 hours a day, by that, preventing the mob from actually ruining the content or ruining the library. One of the few buildings in Egypt that was protected by the inhabitants during the whole spring, Arabic spring in Egypt. Now, the same thing with the opera, which you've heard mentioned. You know, it's individual and it's collective. It has to take both. It has to have the capacity of taking both things in. But generosity is now also becoming, of course, our last money design, which is now coming out. Um, and you, you can see it's sort of pixelated in different lengths of pixelation. Now, the length and size of, or length of these pixelations are based on the before scale of wind. Right? So if you have a square pixel like here, you know, no wind. A little longer little more wind, a little longer, even more wind, more wind, and, you know, with a thousand crowner, you have full storm, right? <laughs> so, in effect, you know that the stronger the wind blows, the more you're spending. <laughs> but also, being generous is about giving from yourself. We were asked by the Indaba, uh, organization in, in Cape Town to design an arch for an arch for Desmond Tutu. Now, he's, he's getting very old, and he has nothing sort of physical left after him. So the, the question was to design an arch that he would then endorse, and now we have like three... This is just a prototype, now we have three really big outdoor arches coming in Johannesburg and two in Cape Town. But it's important. Being generous is not about m making your own money. Right? Money is just a device for getting from A to B, making sure you can do what you want to do. We have never made money. And I'm quite proud of that, actually. <laughs> uh, trusting presence. What does that mean? In our office, we have four places which we really enjoy, which we really like. 
One is the big dining table where everything can happen, meetings, you know, we have the chef serving uh, lunch every day, sort of healthy meals. We have uh, about 30 different nations represented in, in the office, 50% uh, women. You know, men and women don't eat the same thing. Uh, we have seven religions. They don't eat the same thing. Uh, we have all, almost all sexual preferences. They more or less eat the same thing. But, uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but apart from that, you know, it's an open space which completely and continuously transforms, right? And that is an important flexibility within the office. So this has become kind of a symbol. Then we have the Monday meeting, or trafficking as we call it, where the 120 people located in these offices meet every Monday to talk about work plan, talk about love life, talk about divorce, talk about you know, what they did during the weekend. And it starts every day, every Monday, with a poem. And that's a poem relay, you know, sort of shifts between the people in the office. Then we have the coffee machine. Most important drug in the world, no question. And of course, the workshops and the robots, and how these things collaborate. So these four things together sort of become extremely important places for the people in the office. Martial art, OK. Martial art is when you use the forces against you and turn them back without using a lot of force. It's the opposite of boxing, you could say. So when there's a force coming against you, you know how to twist that force to become part of your own movement and go back against your own enemy. Now we designed this little building here um, on ground zero. You can see all the other big names and big buildings looking down at the little Snata building. But you know, it's nice. They can, they can look at us. I don't mind. They can look at a nice roof. So this is the building down here compared to all these other huge things. Now, working against forces that you cannot deal with really means you have to understand them and adapt them. This is a small tree house in the northern parts of Sweden, which really only takes the location and turns that into its asset. So you might think it's a mirror, but it can't be a mirror, right? because you see the top of the trees. If it was a mirror, you would see the ground. So it's a photo of that particular location before the treehouse was built, projected back onto a large-scale photograph. Now, all these things are working against forces. Eat, love, and pray. Take every opportunity to party. You know, celebrate every little victory. Everything that comes your way and you think is worthwhile, party for it. Make sure that you do it together. Make sure that this is an inspiration for people. Make sure you can talk about it. Make sure you can throw it out into the room and say, yes, it's great. It's a little step, but it's great. It really makes a difference to get into this position to share these smaller victories at a large scale. And finally, I'm, you know, out of these kind of drivers, I'm going to show you one, to me, very important driver. Uh, it's called uh, punk production, which means in our profession, it's very important to break the law. It's, it's really very important to, to break the building regulations. You know, the, the building regulations have been established based on mistakes done before, right? So by sort of preventing you from moving forward, all of a sudden you have a legal situation which tells you you can't do that because we tried it before and it didn't work or it turned into a mistake. Now, everyone I know still keeps saying there's one thing important in business life. Don't repeat your mistakes. Don't do the same mistake again. I love making the same mistake. I, I, <laughs> I, I think in the end, it's part of how you learn, because the condition of that mistake has changed in time, in sequence, in context. So you cannot ever, ever do the same mistake, but you can do similar mistakes. So punk production, to me, is very important. I can also say, for instance, on the steps of the Opera House before opening, we were told by the governmental body, uh, client body, to actually locate small marks on the steps so people wouldn't fall. 
well, of course, we deliberately mounted sort of these sticky uh, kind of small marks on the steps for them to fall off after a week. <laughs> so we had the inspection. The people came in, looked at it. It's perfectly fine. You mark the edge of every step. After a week, they were gone. Now, <laughs> punk production is important. architecture is to plan for the unforeseen. Things you don't know anything about at the time when you're designing. If you find a designer or an architect telling you, I know everything about my building for the next hundred years, it's a lie. Coincidences in the sense of user sequence and movement of society, there's one thing you know for sure, that it's never ever going to be used exactly the way you were thinking. But the Opera House is a hybrid. And for the city government in Oslo, it's a big problem. Because they don't know in the urban plan if they should show it as a plaza or as a building. So we don't have the tools. We don't have the tools to design our cities in the hybrid manner we should. When we say we use the site twice, once for the Opera House and number two for the public, then all of a sudden you have a hybrid building. You all of a sudden got the whole site for free for the public. Simple. I'm going to run you through, if I have the time, I'm not sure how much time I've spent. I'm finished, right? <laughs> OK, so you won't see the projects. Uh, OK, I'll run through them. It'll be like an image show, right? I won't say much. We'll just go. Beehives, very important for cities, and especially important for smart cities. Now, small keyless structures like this one at Dovre for looking at reindeer, production lines, carving the wood, using the locations, using the situation. Small cabin on the west coast of Norway for people walking the mountains, keyless, door always open. It can house 21 people for staying overnight. And hand carving the wood with the axe, right? Not one element of machinery used for this building. Or the Lofoten Opera is a hotel which will come up the next two years. Or small places for people that actually travel along the roads, tourist road systems. Music pavilions like the Two Balloon for the jazz concert in Kongsberg. Or the Eyelight Marina Bay uh, pavilion from our side called Lampshade, consists of thousand um, a photovoltaic uh, lamps, individual lamps, then after the exhibition transported to Myanmar for uh, places that don't have uh, electricity. The Serpentine Pavilion in London, you know, with the poets actually reading marathon poems 24 hours a day over three months. Play Tower for Swarovski in Austria, where we take the outside and move it in, up. So the kids can climb 24 meters high. Marietta Matan said, kids will never climb, climb higher than they can. They have a feeling of, of, of sort of mastering. If they do, you bring them down. <laughs> it's also great for, you know, people my age. Non-programmed buildings. This is in Toronto, the Ryerson Library. Non-programmed. It's being programmed by the students. It's like taking an outdoor plaza and subdividing it up on different floors. Absolutely no program. The program 
changes continuously, like a plaza, like an urban plaza. It moves all the way up through the building, entrance, the summer, the beach. The beach actually was great because people started showing up in bikinis and stuff. It was uh, actually <laughs> quite nice. I think maybe I have to show this film. Also. Maybe. I'm sorry. Titanic moment. <laughs> and so it goes on and on and on. I, I'm just going to push through uh, the slides, but it's massive. Uh, for the moment, we have 15 projects under construction, about 120 on the drawing table spread around the world. Um, and we're having massive amounts of fun. But most importantly, is that we've managed, I think, slowly over a period of 20 years, to establish something that we ourselves believe is valuable to others. So, thank you. Great. Thank you. I know we're not all Norwegian here, but the Norwegians in the room, we're all really proud of you. You know that, yeah? We lo we th we're really proud of you. Yeah, but we are. Thank you. I mean, thank we are. You. And um, I, lo I love, I, I picked up on something there which really touched my heart, actually, and that is that breaking rules leads to such great beauty, doesn't it? Huh? It's really fantastic. I love that. I won't be telling my kids that, but... You should. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the same manner as we've had the most incredible speakers today, I really have to say, amazing. But there is another element that goes through the whole thing compared to the words of trust, humanity, people, understanding these levels. There's one other thing. That is that if you don't do deep dives, if you don't go under the skin of things, you cannot react. No. And ignorance is the most difficult thing in society. And I think all of the speakers today have been speaking against ignorance. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I think to apologize for him. Um, 
You know, what we've had for speakers in the, the inner towns that I've been moderated for is the passion that comes out, the emotions, is brilliant. I loved another thing you said, architecture is the art of prepositions. Yeah. That is amazing. Did you make that up on the spot or? No, we've no? been working on that for a long time. I've yeah, even written a piece I, on it. I was going to say, yeah. That was, that is, that's fantastic. I want to check one thing well, I can't with you. remember everything I've said. You said, you said we've never made any money. I'm proud of that. Really? Uh, we made enough to pay our employees, but not for the owners to become rich. <laughs> But maybe, you know, who knows for the future. I Fantastic. I, uh, lots of questions. I just do, I know we're a little bit over time, but there's a question, a question coming here. You know, you talked about the, um, the collaborative environment. Hmm. Does, that, does that create itself randomly, organically, or are you there creating it? No, it has to be created. It has to be created. Yeah. It won't happen. If you leave it people alone... It has to be created and curated. And curated. Yeah. And um, it needs setups, and it needs teaching, and it needs patience, and it needs... Uh, Nourishment, it needs energy, it needs to be fed. And can that be transferred to other companies? Absolutely. Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's easy, not easy, but Very, it's completely it, Actually, it's easy. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. <laughs> but Sheth it's easy. Shethil, you're my kind of guy, really, no, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, yeah? Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Brilliant.